Here's what's coming up on episode 80 of the Big Seance Podcast. Parapsychologist Lloyd Auerbach. Psychic phenomena does include ghosts. We study extrasensory perception, which is information abilities. We study psychokinesis, which is mind over matter abilities, experiences, of course. And we study phenomena related to, and experiences related to survival of bodily death, which is the idea that our consciousness, our mind can leave the body, survive the death of the body, and of course, communicate back. Uh, and especially given recent clinical evidence that working with a medium can be a grief relief. So from a psychological perspective, so there, there actually is clinical evidence to show this. Now. Well, you can't really have a ghostly experience without the witness having some form of ESP, being able to pick up on the ghost. And from the ghost perspective, let's think about this. You're dead. You have no body. How in the world do you see the world? How do you perceive? How do you communicate? How do you move things? That's all ESP and PK. That's all the psychic senses, psychic modalities. Without that, there's nothing. Unfortunately, it's really because of the supposed experts who are the TV celebrities who have no background themselves or little or no background. You know, they're, they're setting a bad example. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. I realize Thanksgiving was a week ago, but I feel like starting this episode off with a big thank you. It may seem cheesy, but it's you who I want to thank. You, the one listening in your car, the one listening on your run or your walk, the one listening at work, maybe even with a needle and a thread in your hands. You, the one listening at the gym, where I should be right now. You, the one listening while making dinner or washing dishes. The one listening with a hot beverage and a lit candle nearby. The one listening while sitting in front of the computer, even. And even the you who may have stumbled upon this podcast for the very first time. Thank you. The other night I came home after a long day and I was tired and I decided I just needed some paranerd time. So where did I go? I went to the big seance parlor on Facebook to chat with my peeps and it was all better. So I'm also very thankful for those of you who contribute to the conversations in our own big seance parlor community where recently I've even seen fellow paranerds reach out for advice or opinions. And, you know, people seem to respectfully jump in and help. And that's awesome. So thank you. And if you haven't joined that big seance parlor community on Facebook, please do. Um, I'll try to put that community link in the show notes, or you can just go to Facebook and search for big seance parlor. We should be the first thing that pops up. You know, I'm currently not able to produce the frequency of episodes that I'd like and that many of you have requested, but I do want you to know that I put so much passion and energy into this podcast, and I truly get excited to share each and every episode with you. But here's the thing. If no one listened... If no one shared the episodes with other paranerds, if no one pressed play, then it would be me talking to myself. And what's the point of that? We continue to grow at a consistent but gradual pace, and so thank you for helping me to grow our community. I also need to thank the guests who have joined us over the years. You know, what would we do without their wisdom? and their stories. 
I'm excited to share with you this week's conversation with highly respected parapsychologist Lloyd Auerbach. The audio on Lloyd's side of our conversation is not as clear as I would have liked it to be. We had a few techie problems, but I did process that audio as much as I could, and so I think you'll enjoy the conversation still. And right after that, we'll have another Spectral Edition with Tim Prossel, this one titled A Ghostly Threat to Tourism. Sounds so very interesting. I can't wait. And finally, we'll have some listener feedback. You know what time it is. Time to pour the tea. I have the honor of speaking to the Lloyd Auerbach, who has a Master's of Science in Parapsychology, is the Director of the Office of Paranormal Investigations and President of the Forever Family Foundation. We're going to hear quite a bit about that today, I think. And he's been in the field for over 35 years, focusing on parapsychological education and field investigation. He has just reprinted his first book, ESP Hauntings and Poltergeists, a parapsychologist's handbook for its 30th anniversary. He is the author of nine other books, including The Ghost Detective's Guide to Haunted San Francisco, co-authored with the late renowned psychic Annette Martin. In 2014, he released ESP Wars East and West, covering the psychic spying programs of the U.S. and Soviet Union Russia, co-authored by Dr. Edwin C. May, who ran the U.S. program, Dr. Victor Rubel and Joseph McMonagall, I think I'm saying that right, the project's number one remote viewer. He is a professor at Atlantic University and JFK University and teaches parapsychology local and distance through HCH Institute in Lafayette, California, and online courses through the Rhine Education Center. He is on the board of directors of the Rhine Research Center and the advisory board of the Windbridge Institute. His media appearances on TV, radio, and in print number in the thousands, including ESPN's Sports Center, which is interesting, ABC's The View, Oprah and Larry King Live. He works as a parapsychologist, professional mentalist, psychic entertainer, public speaking, and media, social media skills coach, and as a professional chocolatier. Totally going to ask him about that. Visit his public speaking site at uh, speakasyourself.com and his main website at mindreader.com. Lloyd, it is such... An honor. Welcome to the parlor here at the Big Seance Podcast. Thank you very much, Patrick. I first heard of you and your work not even 10 years ago, really, when I, you know, first kind of started to become a paranormal nerd, paranerd, we like to call them here. And, <laughs> uh, but that's when I heard you on Jim Harold's Paranormal Podcast. And uh-huh. since then, I always try to catch every interview. I can find, but you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, very long time. I, you know, in some respects, I've been doing it since I was a kid. Um, I had a parapsychology club in high school that I started with some friends with the help of a couple of our science teachers. So it's been a, a long, long ride. I, I kind of count my professional start when I, well, in 1979 when I started graduate school. Well, I do know we probably have some paranormal newbies listening now. So... Tell us what parapsychology is and then maybe what it isn't, because I'm sure there are misconceptions, right? A lot, yeah. Well, parapsychology, which has been relatively ignored by the the paranormal ghost hunting shows for a variety of reasons, is actually the science that studies psychic phenomena. And contrary to what some of the TV shows like to talk about, uh, psychic phenomena does include ghosts. Uh, We study extrasensory perception, which is information abilities. We study psychokinesis, which is mind over matter abilities and experiences, of course. And we study phenomena related and experiences related to survival of bodily death, which is the idea that our consciousness, our mind can 
leave the body, survive the death of the body, and of course, communicate back. So all of that is connected in many ways. And while parapsychology as a term was not really used across the board until probably the 1920s, 1930s, psychical research was the phrase that was used prior to that and still used in different parts of the world and kind of as an equivalent. Studying the ghostly, the psychic is all part of a continuum. And we've been doing it since officially the start of the Society for Psychical Research in 1882, which is still very active in England, actually more active than they've been in years. Um, Parapsychology does not study in the laboratory ghosts, but we do study mediums and mediumship and other things in the laboratory. We we can't get ghosts to um, show up on a time clock, unfortunately, in a lab. <laughs> which is really unfortunate. But we do obviously field work, which is what the investigation part is. And that's been going on since the 19th century quite a bit. We don't, however, deal with cryptids, you know, with with Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster. We don't deal with um, UFOs, unless, of course, we have some telepathic aliens and want to be tested or something. (laughs) And we don't deal strictly with techniques of divination or fortune telling from astrology to tarot card reading, things like that. Although some of those techniques can actually be ways for people to be more psychic. Uh, They can Mm. be just practices that encourage people to be more psychic. We focus on people's abilities and the abilities of, I guess you could say, apparitions of ghosts, because uh, any communication from a ghost is technically ESP. Well, I think you just cleared up kind of a misconception I think I've probably always had that you know, there's this divide between more psychic, spiritual, ESP type things, and then ghosts and hauntings. But from your point of view, I guess it's all kind of one bag. Well, you can't really have a ghostly experience without the witness having some form of ESP, being able to pick up on the ghost. And from the ghost perspective, let's think about this. You're dead. You have no body. How in the world do you see the world? How do you perceive? How do you communicate? How do you move things? That's all ESP and PK. That's all the psychic senses, psychic modalities. Without that, there's nothing. So you can't separate extrasensory perception and psychokinesis from ghosts and hauntings. Certainly poltergeist phenomena is strictly PK of the living that we look at. You know, I'm, I know there's more to a person than their big nerdy passion. And, you know, we're going to get to the chocolate a little later, but what does a typical day in parapsychology look like for you? Well, for me, it, you know, it really depends for other researchers is different. Um, unfortunately making a living as a parapsychologist is very difficult because there are very few laboratory or research organization jobs out there that pay a living wage or have even have openings for that. So I don't actually make my living, uh, make part of my living doing parapsychology work, but I I can't say that there's actually a typical day. So the closest would be a typical day would be, um, um, I go to another work, some other work that I'm doing, either online research or doing some consulting for someone. And then I teach in the evenings uh, or I do some writing in the evenings Uh, on weekends And sometimes on evenings, I will do investigations, or at least I will, I guess you could say, manage the investigators I have working with me. I do that quite a bit. And today, for example, after doing this podcast, I am going and meeting with a couple of investigators from Boise, Idaho, who are driving through to San Francisco to talk about some possible projects. So it it varies quite a bit. Uh, I mostly focus on field work, but I do Beside the writing that I do, I also consult with other researchers from time to time on uh, ideas around life after death. And, of course, I'm working with foundations like the Forever Family Foundation and also the Rhine Research Center. I'm on the board there and teach classes, online classes for the Rhine. So I guess, you know, my my typical answer is what day of the week are you asking me about? (laughs) I'm sure. Uh, And, you know, you have a normal life like everybody else with, you know, things that happen and and family. And yeah. So let's jump into this Forever Family Foundation. And I'm particularly you started uh, mentioning it a little earlier, but I'm particularly interested in the evaluation certification Mm -hmm. for mediums that you have going on over there. I'm totally fascinated by that. Tell us about Forever Family. 
Well, the Forever Family Foundation was started a little over 10 years ago by uh, Bob and Fran Ginsburg, who had lost their daughter in an accident. And through uh, a series of odd events, uh, a medium who was doing a reading for a friend of theirs, a neighbor, got messages from their daughter. And Bob was a total skeptic at the time. But as he was given that message and then went to see the medium with his skepticism fully out, he was more and more convinced there's something real. And he also, he and his wife, both, uh, he and Fran both figured that they got a great benefit out of working with the medium. And they thought that this could be a great benefit for other folks. So they talked to other parents who had lost kids and other people who had lost relatives who had seen mediums, did that through the mediums that they met, and started the foundation with the intention of making it science-based, so not just purely experientially based, because they really again, where Bob came from, from the skeptical perspective, and where Fran wanted to come from was legitimacy and credibility. And they, so they involved as the founders, a few researchers, and they started this organization to both support research and researchers who are looking into experiences and phenomena around the afterlife, and also to support the work of mediums in the family grieving process. And along with that, they came up with a process by which they would vet the mediums that were going to be officially uh, named by the foundation. So they started doing a certification program where the mediums have to provide real evidence, meaning factual information about the pe- about a number of sitters, people who are being read uh, in a, a very con- controlled environment in a way that the mediums could not have actually researched those people beforehand and so on. So it's a a couple step process with the medium doing multiple readings for different people and then being graded for the evidential value, not the emotional value, although that is part of the grade too, but for the evidential material. And that's worked out very well. I mean, not every medium who's very good passes that partly because I know of one medium, for example, who has who doesn't do very well with Skype. She does great on the phone, but she can't do Skype (laughs) interviews for whatever reason. Or Skype reading. She does them great in per- person too. And so sometimes people don't pass the protocol the first time. But the folks who have made it through come through with very specific information. Do you ever run into mediums who are hesitant to be put to the test and have their abilities evaluated? I can imagine that you'd have to have, you have to be really confident, I guess. You'd have to be really strong to just jump in there and open yourself to this. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people out there who may have some mediumistic ability. There are, there's actually a continuum there. Of course there are the phonies too, mm-hmm. who would never pass must pass this and would stay and do stay away from this. But there's a lot of people in between who may have some mediumistic ability who've had some ex- personal experiences and they have no control over them. So then once they find out what the tests actually is to be certified, it's not just simply volunteering. They actually um, don't, they may not, actually go through the certification process. They kind of back off. Uh, so when people drop, uh, say that they're interested and then they drop off, it can be because they're afraid they won't do well. It can be because they know they can't do well. It also can be because uh, there, there are requirements when we certify people for our, our organization. It's not just we put a stamp on you and you're done. Uh, you have to stay involved with the foundation. Uh, our mediums have to volunteer uh, something once a year. And if they don't do that, their certification gets pulled. So it's not just passing the test. It's actually participating in this. It's a it's a 501 C3 nonprofit organization. It's an all volunteer organization. Nobody gets paid. And sometimes people who want to be certified think that um, it's going to be to their advantage because we're going to promote them, but they're not going to give anything back. And I we have uh, mutual friends, I believe, Claire Broad and Teresa Chung. Right. Over in the UK. And I have to tell you, I hadn't heard of mediums who were so pro this research and um, having abilities be tested until I started talking to them. And I I mean, I had no clue that, you know, there were so many mediums out there that were very (laughs) much in uh, for this kind of thing so that they can, you know, have science help prove that. They're really doing it. I think it's cool. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've known psychics and mediums over the years since I got involved in this field. 
And in general, I find that while I've met some really excellent psychics uh, who do volunteer for scientific research, it's pretty rare for a, for a person who says that they're psychic to want to know how their abilities work and why they're working and know about that, the research. But relatively universally, the mediums I've met have a real curiosity on the science. Uh, so when we've had conferences in the past for the Forever Family Foundation, most of our conferences have been kind of half science, so half res researchers presenting and half mediums doing their thing. And in those conferences, the mediums always sit through all of the science presentations. And that's something I've not seen with a lot of psychics in the past. And I, <laughs> I kind of put it down to the mediums being um, people persons. You know, they're dealing with people living and they're dealing with people dead. So they have to have their good people skills, whereas psychics don't always have to have people skills. <laughs> so your uh, Forever Family Foundation, I noticed you have afterlife discussion groups too. And I bet this is probably a big part of it and and people can reach out if they're i'm assuming if they're grieving and things like that is that how this works that's correct um they can join the forever family foundation on the website foreverfamilyfoundation.org it's free to join at the moment and the afterlife discussion groups uh we only have a few of them pretty much on the east coast that's where the foundation is actually headquartered but we're going to try and start some here on the west coast and i know there are a couple starting in the midwest from what i understand they they're there's pretty strict oversight because they are connected to the foundation for those groups. But we're, we do try to help people who are in grief as much as we possibly can. Most of the mediums do readings by phone or by Skype uh, who are listed in that. The certified mediums are all listed on the website, in fact. And we also put out a twice a year magazine, beautiful magazine, which people can get either in hard copy, believe it or not, by snail, ma snail mail for free, or they can get it online, you know, get it as a uh, PDF download. Uh, but we've got some other activities. We just had a conference last weekend in Fort Myers, Florida, our first one that was mainly geared at the mediums themselves and at wannabe mediums, uh, people who are already professionals or people who are who have mediumistic abilities. And so it was I was the only scientist presenting at all uh, that weekend it was more about practice and practical stuff. And I actually did a couple of classes for people, too. And uh, we also had uh, a large number of people who were in grief who really wanted to connect with the mediums as much as possible. And we do these grief retreats every so often. We've got one next July in Connecticut. Uh, so it, it is a good, it's a great place for people to connect. Uh, and especially given recent clinical evidence that working with a medium can be a grief relief. So from a psychological perspective, so there, there actually is clinical evidence to show this now. That's, that's really cool to hear. Actually. Do you um, want to tell us a little bit about what's going on at, with Rhine? Some of the research there. Sure. Well, the Rhine research center, which is the probably longest uh, running laboratory in the United States. It started originally at Duke university. JB Rhine started that and the, the parapsychology research lab there in the 1930s, and then he moved it off campus when he retired in 1965, when it became the Institute for Parapsychology, renamed the Rhine Research Center after he passed away. And the Rhine Center, which is near Duke campus, has local programs for, for anybody in the Research Triangle Park or anywhere in North Carolina. There are researchers who go in and lecture, uh, and, other, and psychics and other people who do, give lectures and presentations every other week. But the research that goes on, which is grant-based, is right now um, quite a bit aimed at bioenergy. There's a bioenergy lab looking at how our brains give off photons. Most people are unaware there are biophotons being given off by your brain all the time, uh, particles of light. Now, it's not enough to ever be seen, uh, even when it's extreme, but they are detectable under controlled conditions, and they're looking at how the, the brains of healers and martial artists, when they're doing their thing, the increase in biophoton emission is huge. It's a big, big leap. So uh, that's one of the things that they're actually doing research on right now. Uh, also planning some work in out-of-body experience research and uh, just focusing on the, the public programs as much as possible. We also offer classes. Uh, you know, I should mention the Ryan Education Center, part of the Ryan Research Center, uh, I'm one of the main instructors, uh, John Kruth, who is the executive director, also teaches classes, and Ryan Hurd, who is a researcher in DreamWork, 
teaches classes there. And we teach online classes. So we have students from all over the world taking the classes uh, of all sorts. And there's classes that we run kind of as academic classes so people can go for a grade or just simply take them as an audit. Uh, or they, we also have some classes that are just done for fun. And I've done both kinds of classes for folks. So we have like four-week classes and eight-week classes. And they're all recorded so people don't have to worry about sitting on, online live. Uh, but there are discussion forums. We run them like an actual online class uh, that universities run. I've looked into taking classes there and looked into the Rhine several times in the last 10 years. And then I hear you speak and I hear, and I'm like, I'm not so sure I'm smart enough for this. Who oh. is <laughs> Who is a good candidate for either programs in parapsychology, which I know there are not a ton of anymore, or these classes at the Rhine, who who would be a good candidate to check those out? Well, for the Rhine classes, uh, you know, we do have some research-oriented classes. So unless you are, my, your interests run in the idea, towards the idea of, con, of laboratory research and statistics, they may not be the right classes for you. <laughs> but, I, you know, we teach cl- other kinds of classes at the Rhine. I mean, I teach an investigations class where the assumption is you don't know anything. <laughs> Teach an introduction to parapsychology class where the assumption is you have an interest, but you don't know anything. So the candidates for those classes are people who have a real interest. You know, the whether or not you want to take for a grade, you can even decide that midway. Some people just want, they want to earn a certificate because we do offer a certificate um, for a group of classes and also for the intro class. But other people just want to take it because of their interest. And uh, the amount, it really depends on the amount of work you want to put in, whether you want to answer the discussion questions and take part in that uh, or take the quizzes, for example. And you don't have to. So if you just want the information, just want to learn about stuff and you can still participate in the discussion forums without being graded. So I'd say that the, the who which should take them is anyone with an interest in psychic phenomena of any sort. Some of the classes may appeal to you more than others, uh, but anybody should take those. And then if you have a real academic interest, you take them for a grade and you take the series of classes and that's going to give you some credibility within the field of parapsychology, just as courses I offer separately through a local course, uh, local school here. I offer some distance learning classes, which are audio based. So they're a different format and people earn a certificate for that. And anybody can take those since we do offer an intro, a short intro piece as well. And the, the certificate for that gets you again, entry into the world of parapsychology science, I guess you could say. It gives you some cred there as well. Now, you mentioned earlier that Paranormal TV is not exactly a fan of parapsychology and that there was a reason for that. What are those reasons? The main reason is that the shows don't like our approach in that we don't jump, number one, if something happens, we don't freak out. (laughs) Uh, Number two, we don't work in the dark. Because that's actually so, there's no precedent for that outside of, frankly, the seances of the early 20th century. There really is no, and certainly no scientific precedent for working in the dark. And considering most people don't have their experiences when the lights are out, they have them during the day uh, when the lights are on fully. It makes no sense. makes no sense at all. And we're not going to immediately say, well, you know, there's a demon here. We're not going to jump to a conclusion. I may say there's a, I think there's a ghost here, but... Uh, there's a question as to what's actually the motivation in that. And, you know, these shows want to focus on the personalities of the investigators. They don't want to focus on what actually might be going on. They don't even want to normally explore the why, Um, you know, why is somebody, why is the ghost there? They just want stuff being experienced. They can show on TV and they'll fake it if they have to. And and with the growing number of paranormal teams and ghost hunting, I hate that term, ghost hunting teams, you know, yeah. running around, are, are people like this signing up for Rhine classes? Do they, how are we going to get this to change? Well, um, I'd say there's, I, I met somebody who's been around the paranormal community for a while and he said he figures there's probably about four to 5% of the people out there who are actually interested in figuring out what's going on. Um, the ones who might be interested in learning more. Most, most of the people I've met have no interest in learning. They, go to these paranormal conferences, which are, are almost more set up like Star Trek conventions because you have the paranormal <laughs> celebrities there. 
And that's the main reason they're going. That and sing, sitting around in the dark trying to get EVP. That seems to be the other real attraction. And it's fine from a, you know, a thrill seeker um, experiential perspective, but there's nothing there that really, there's no there there. <laughs> there's nothing really there. <laughs> um, so we have some people in these groups who, or who are interested in joining a group or starting a group who realize that there's much more to it than what they see on TV. They may have run across some parapsychology books. They may have run across my books or those of a couple of my colleagues um, or seen us on, on video somewhere and something struck a chord in them. Uh, and then, you know, so those people do have an interest. There are those people who have been around doing investigations for a long time who realize that it's pretty boring to sit around in the dark and just try to get EVP. So there's got to be more to it. And then, so they'll start exploring that. Uh, and then there are a few who just realize that what they're getting with their tech and the focus on the tech just is missing something. And it's actually missing the experience, which supports what the tech does. Uh, so they figure out that they have to go and learn more. And they find as soon as they start that there's a whole world that opens up to them. I, I found it very disconcerting. Back in 2008, I was on a, a panel, large panel with people from most of the ghost hunting TV shows. It was a conference run by the guys from Paranormal State. And to have a, one of the major principles of the TV show Ghost Hunters actually state that there was no good literature on investigation before the 1990s. <laughs> was, you know, I, I actually spoke out of turn and basically, you know, just had to read them the riot act about that. And fortunately, it was backed up by Michelle Belanger, who's another writer in the subject, because we have, you know, literature going back to the 1800s. And most of it, everything before 1923 is free on the Internet Archive or Google Books. So to say to make that kind of statement indicates the level of actual interest in the subject of that individual from that TV show. Even though he says he, you know, they said they'd been doing it for 30 years. It's like, well, that didn't really fit. <laughs> yeah, the the earlier uh, the writing is on paranormal research, the more fascinating I find it. I don't know why. And if I can find the original book that's, you know, where I can barely turn the pages, I just love that. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of writing out there. There is. I, lo I love, I, I picked up a lot of antiquarian books from the late 1800s, early 1900s, but um, I've got hundreds that I've downloaded from the Internet Archive in different formats. You can put them on my Kindle or Nook or whatever else. Um, I have this little electronic library on my Kindle. So it, it's great to actually go to the Internet Archive and search on psychical research or even just the word psychical uh, or ghost hunting. You know, most there was a ghost hunting book. There was a book called Historic Ghost Hunters, a Ghost Hunting and Ghost Hunters from the early part of the 20th century. So this is not even a new term. It's been around <laughs> since the late 1800s. And the ignorance of the, unfortunately, it's really because of the supposed experts who are the TV celebrities who have no background themselves or little or no background. You know, they're, they're setting a bad example by saying there's nothing there. Um, there's no history here. I actually had someone say to me, well, you guys have been doing it for 100 years. We have to do it differently. It's like, well, but you can't ignore the 100 years that's there and what we have actually found. And what I what I run a, ran into in the last 20 years is people contacting me and with this this idea. What if ghosts are this? And I said, well, that can go back to Frank Podmore in the late 1800s. It's not new. Good idea. I'm glad you came to it on your own. But <laughs> <laughs> not a new idea. Well, you know, I can't I won't be able to pretend because, you know, the listeners will know that I I'm guilty. I am a giant fan of the paranormal shows, but I also have both brains and I, you know, fight with myself with my skeptic side and the believing side back and forth. But it must be kind of a conflict in your eyes, too, because it's, you know, at least in our modern age, the paranormal shows are kind of bringing paranormal back to discussions and yeah. and so it, how how do you feel about that is it a conflict well, very, in your eyes well I, i'm very happy i am conflicted I, i'm very happy that there the shows have put the spotlight on the paranormal you know people tend to forget though that it didn't start with ghost hunters it started in the 1990s really with the tv show sightings before mm -hmm. that even unsolved mysteries but the tv show sightings and then the x-files those were the two kind of germinations of 
the paranormal community, if you will, of going forward from that. But there was a whole time period in the late 60s through the 70s, which publishers call the occult explosion, where there are all these books on the metaphysical and the paranormal and parapsychology and tarot cards and astrology and all sorts of stuff where there was a huge focus on that, on the subject. It just kind of fell out of favor for a while, and now it's back. Um, there are, according to one of my Ryan students who did a survey, she found over 3,000 active ghost hunting groups in the United States alone. So that's got to be at least 15,000 people and probably closer to 30 or 40,000, because some groups have a huge number. And of those people, you know, why aren't we seeing more support of parapsychology or paranormal research. There's no, there's actually no support of research coming from the paranormal community. Uh, they claim that they have their own field, you know, the paranormal field. I keep getting asked, is, what, what is your place in the paranormal field? And it's like, I don't have a place in the paranormal field because <laughs> there is no field. You're not doing anything to, to, to support research. You're going out and capturing EVP. And while there are people who do research on EVP, they're not really doing it from a scientific perspective a lot of times. There are some uh, and I have met a number of people over the years who really have a background in science and are trying to bring the scientific to this, but they still do investigations in the dark, which lead to misperceptions, uh, bang shins, of course, and things like that, and make they make no sense. They just mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense. It's it's one it should be if you're doing investigation in the dark, you do investigation in the light as well. So you do a comparison. You can definitely do it in the dark. It's just that you should compare that against all other conditions and especially against the pattern of what people are reporting. People are very surprised when they ask me, have you been to this location or that location? It's like, you know, I, I don't have a budget to fly around the country to go sit around in an insane asylum or a sanatorium because people said it's haunted because it was fit, you know, featured on a TV show. If I I've been to places where um, there were no witnesses, you know, there's a lot of folklore around the place. And unless I have a witness to talk to who can tell me about their personal experience, which at least allow, gives me a context for anything we might pick up on any equipment, it's just, it's just a rumor and folklore. We're just investigating a rumor or folklore. I find it interesting that, um, you know, I think sometimes these haunted spots are overblown uh, quite a bit just because of the paranormal shows, because... I've, you know, I've stayed overnight at the Myrtles, slept like a baby. I've stayed overnight three or four nights at the Stanley, slept like a baby. Uh, I <laughs> stayed overnight at the Lemp Mansion. You know, it was uncomfortable, but I think most of it was my own mind. But, you know, I, right. I slept. <laughs> and so, and I'm not necessarily the most um, psychic or intuitive person in the world, but I'm like, man, why didn't things happen that are supposed to happen here? Well, that's the thing is they get they do get overblown in the sense that um, people expect to have an experience and you don't always. Uh, I know I've talked to many people who've had real experiences, including some very good witnesses at the Myrtles over the years um, and at the Stanley from this who were who have been to the Stanley. They were not ghost hunters, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were they were people who had had experiences who reported them. Otherwise, we have the USS Hornet Aircraft Carrier Museum out here, which to my mind, is probably one of the most populated by spirits anywhere uh, based on and that's based not on a personal experience, although I've had a couple experiences there. That's based on a range of witness experiences, including multiple witnesses who have had the same experience at the same time and uh, cu coupled with other evidence and other things. Uh, but everybody who goes to the Hornet does not have an experience. And let's face it, that's if we're dealing with actual ghosts. That's as much dependent on them as it is on you. Uh, people have told me that they've gone to this haunted place or that and all these witnesses and they never get any evidence. They said, well, have you asked? That's number one. And number two, if you go in there, guns blazing, like many ghost hunting groups do, the odds are the ghosts, if they're like most normal people, because that's what most ghosts are, is like most normal people, they're going to avoid you like the plague. <laughs> they're just going to stay away from you. Um, and so, you know, you have to what happens with these shows and what happens with the way they tell people to approach these situations doesn't fit with the research, the field work that has been done and the, the ways to get best evidence, the ways to actually get the best encounters, if you will. So we try to go for a Victorian parlor kind of atmosphere oh. here. 
And uh, I just want to know if you could go back in time and evaluate or test one or two of the big players from the spiritualism movement, spiritualist movement, who, who would you, who would that be? Well, um, Leonora Piper was one major player who had a lot of researchers kind of supporting her. Uh, Eusapia Palladino was a very interesting character where, um, you know, she was a mix, what we call a mixed medium where she, she was caught cheating. And on the same, at the same time, she performed under extremely well-controlled conditions. So depending on how closely somebody was watching her, if they're watching her closely, apparently real phenomena happen. If they weren't watching her closely, because as she apparently told one of the researchers, it was much easier for her physically to cheat than it was for her to do something real because mm-hmm. it took a lot out of her. Uh, some of the reports indicated a uh, weight loss that she would have approximately five pounds. That's one of the ways that they actually knew she was doing something genuine is she would lose weight. And uh, Scott Rogo, the late Scott Rogo, who's uh, one of my predecessors, who's an amazing researcher. He passed away in 1990. Scott did a lot of looking at the literature and reports on all sides of Palladino and felt that there was genuine evidence for her activity. But again, she played fast and loose, uh, kind of like Uri Geller does in some respects, mm-hmm. depending on who, who is studying her. Um, there were there have been a number of other, of course, Daniel Douglas Hume is a very controversial figure from the late 1800s who apparently in, in light, you know, he didn't have lights out. He did a lot of physical activity, supposedly from the spirits, but controversial from the skeptics perspective because they don't trust any of the witness reports or they won't, they refuse to trust, trust any of the witness reports, even though some were by multiple witnesses. So that's another individual who I'd say was pretty damned interesting. How often do you catch straight up fraud? Does that happen? It does happen. You know, we're not dealing with physical mediums that much anymore. Although I did sit in a, a session from uh, Kai Mugu, who is a German medium, uh, physical medium at, I've Seems heard a lot mixed, about him lately. Yeah, I mean, he's a mixed medium. Steve Browdy's been doing studies with him for a number of years. And I know some of the controlled conditions that Kai has actually produced phenomena were, were extremely well controlled. And it would have been next to impossible for anyone to fake things. And yet, when I had my session with him, I, I frankly walked away partly because of the conditions, partly because of some suspicious behavior Kai had towards me. <laughs> um, but just some things that I saw as a trained mentalist and magician, there were several things that were a little more than a little suspicious. And one thing I, I'm positive was fraud. So I, you know, it's, it's a difficult circumstance when you're working in the dark and that's always going to be the case that anything that happens in the dark is going to be suspect. Even if you check out the entire room and strip search someone and do all that stuff, there's still, suspicion because there could be collusion with somebody bringing somebody else bringing stuff into the room. So, you know, it's tough, but I have caught, uh, frauds. There was a, there was a metal bender named Ronnie Marcus from Israel who in the mid 1990s was brought over here, kind of like Geller was. And he was absolutely a fake. Uh, he may have had some real ability because everybody does, but it certainly was not demonstrated for me or several other people who, uh, who were looking into him, who I was advising, uh, on some controls here in the Bay Area. Uh, and I've run across occasional phonies, really from the perspective of someone in a home who was faking, trying to fake out their other, their other family members, not trying to fake me out. In fact, one of the things that's really interesting is there is fraud in cases, but the last thing the people doing the fraud want is a, a researcher coming in an actual mm. research coming in because we can catch them typically. Um, so it's really f- fraud on family is what we normally run into. And then there are some phone calls I get, which are fairly either incredibly suspicious or the person just out and out crazy. Yeah. We have a question from two of my most supportive listeners, and that is Lana and John of the carbon lilies blog. And they sent in a question today because I told um, some people that I was going to do this. 
and yep. they want to know how do you deal we you may have kind of answered this how do you deal with those people in other scientific fields of study who downplay the importance of paranormal research well um i usually raise the question of science itself um if science is about learning what how the world works and how we work and our place in the world which is what it is it's science is a process it's not or at least it should be a process not dogma People have these experiences. I mean, let's face it. You have millions of people over the last century alone who have had what are considered psychic or paranormal experiences. They cannot all be misperception, fraud, or hallucination. Certainly not hallucination. Uh, I love hearing from the skeptics that it's mass hallucination, and I challenge them to show me the literature establishing the validity of mass hallucination because it really isn't much of anything. We have a lot more literature showing the existence of ghosts. So we have these experiences people have. How is it not scientific to look at them? And that's usually the question I put to them. How is it not scientific? And a lot of times the response is, well, because ghosts can't possibly exist or because ESP is not possible. I said, okay, fine. So then why aren't you researching this? Mm. You know, why is no one actually researching this from that perspective, from trying to figure out what it is because what it turns out is that any, the idea of studying a paranormal experience because it's already been labeled or put in that category, usually by them, not by us, uh, that immediately gives it a stigma so that m- mainstream science doesn't want to look at it. They don't want to touch it. And that is about as unscientific as you can come. And you know, I try to embarrass them, basically, is what I try to do. And that's why... Parapsychology, you were saying earlier, there's not a lot of work right now. That's correct. There's next to no funding. There's really only one main foundation that supports some research in parapsychology here in the States. Um, you know, it, it turns, it, it's because there's such an academic stigma here, given that, you know, the high percentage of people interested in the subject who have ha- who reportedly have had paranormal or psychic experiences in the general public, it's just almost a crime that no one's looking at it. And of course, you know, um, one other statement that comes from the other side, from the mainstream is, well, you guys are looking at it from the wrong angle. It's like, well, but at least we're looking at it. And we actually are not looking at it from the wrong angle because we're always trying to figure out what else it could be. And many of the non-psychic explanations for things or for individual circumstances, such as certain aspects of misperception or misunderstanding, Uh, the connection with the Earth's magnetic field and hallucinatory experiences, and a number of other similar effects even in psychology come from the research we've done in and around parapsychology, which we provided because we're trying to get to the crux of what's left. And as it turns out, you know, we could be wrong. What's left may be something else, maybe a biological or psychological experience, may not be what we call psychic or paranormal. That's okay, because we're going to be the ones to find that out. Um, it's, it's a shame that no one else is working at all to look at this. Well, I have so many notes left that I didn't get to, but I, we absolutely must get to the most important question, and that is, what's up with the chocolate? All right, so uh, <laughs> that's a, per- one, a personal interest of mine. I'm, I'm a foodie, uh, what we call a foodist, and uh, I've been – wine brought me – California wine brought me to chocolate because there was a resurgence of, or I guess to say an explosion of artisan chocolate in the late 1990s or early 2000s. And I learned a lot about it. And uh, I ended up, because of a suggestion from one of my publishers, doing chocolate tasting demonstrations and guided presentations, which I still do. Uh, And then one of the chocolatiers, one of the chocolate makers I interviewed a number of years ago, Joseph Schmidt, actually suggested that I take a course and learn how to make chocolate if I really wanted to be an expert. And I've been on and off writing a book on the subjects, which I'm hoping to get done in the next few months. But I took a course and got a certificate as a professional chocolatier. And I've made chocolate every now and then under the banner of Haunted by Chocolate. So uh, I do have a website. It's hauntedbychocolate.com for that. And I'm actually meeting with some folks today. The, the paranormal people I'm meeting with today are also interested in having me do some ghost chocolates for them. So uh, which I've done before. I make ghost drops. <laughs> I have to, this is one uh, fat paranormal nerd who will read your book on chocolate. I promise you. I'll be following <laughs> you. 
Yeah, it, it, it's been fun. I, I haven't been able to haven't had the opportunity to do a lot of chalk in the last year, but I'm going to be doing some more again soon. And uh, actually, uh, one of the haunted locations is doing a Valentine's Day thing uh, coming up, and they've asked me to make and bring and sell chocolates there. So I'll be be uh, doing my haunted by chocolate thing at the, at the McConaughey House in Hayward, California, in February. And uh, it's always a fun thing to do. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's it's you know it's one of my hobbies, and chocolate is just an amazing substance anyway. It's magical in many respects. Well, Lloyd, you rock. If there's any part of your message that you didn't have a chance to share with us today, take this opportunity and tell us where you know we find everything, Lord, our Lord, Lord, you're a Lord now, Lloyd Auerbach. Well, um, first, I just re-released my first book, which people cite as like their inspiration for stuff. ESP Hauntings and Poltergeist is available again through Amazon. Um, it's the 30th anniversary reprint. Uh, I've made a few changes to it, but that's available. My books from 10 years ago, Ghost Hunting, and the other one is Hauntings and Poltergeist, also available from Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and everywhere else. And a, a fun book, uh, really kind of a real fun book that I wrote with my writing partner, late partner. She was a psychic medium that I worked with for many years. She passed away in 2011. A book called Ghost De- The Ghost Detective's Guide to Haunted San Francisco, which in which Annette Martin and I take you with us as we investigate a few places deeply in the San Francisco area. So it's more, it's as much about how we, how a psychic and a parapsychologist work together and how she communicated with the spirits than it was about the places themselves, but there definitely are ghost stories in there too. So that's a uh, more recent book that's also available. And my website, which I'm hoping will be back up in the next couple of weeks, it's been down for a while because of some server issues, is is mindreader.com. But of course, there's hauntedbychocolate.com. And also, um, as you mentioned, I'm a public speaking consultant. So that site is up. It's speakasyourself.com. And the next couple of months, I'm working on a project with some of my folks to launch a brand new website, which is more than just me, a lot more than just me, uh, from the scientific side of the paranormal called Invisible Signals. And it'll be InvisibleSignals.com. And that hopefully will be up by the end of the year or beginning of next year as well. I want to mention, I just also, I'm on Facebook, but please go to my author page and like me there because I'm, I'm maxed out on friends. <laughs> Got it. Understood. And we'll put all those links in the show notes and uh, so people can click on those. It is for real such an honor to be able to talk to you after following you for all these years. And so thanks for, for being here and talking to us. You rock. Thank you, Patrick. My pleasure. You're listening to the Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes and be sure to check out BigSeance.com for more discussion. Welcome to Spectral Edition. I'm Tim Prossel. If you know the movie Jaws, you're going to see a little bit of that in today's article. It was published in the Evening World from New York on April 24th, 1894. The headline is Canarsie's Ghost in Black. Garbed as a woman, it frightens people at the graveyard. Even spoke to a young man who offered to act as escort. And before I start reading this, I should point out that there's mention of the wild man of the woods. This was sort of an early version of Bigfoot, maybe Bigfoot's grandfather. And it's interesting to see that there was a sighting near Long Island. Canarsie, Long Island, April 24th. All of the people of Canarsie are as much excited over the repeated announcement that there is a ghost in town as were their neighbors of Rockaway Beach a year or so ago by the wild man of the woods. Bay men and boathouse keepers talk of little else than the apparition that is said to nightly haunt the church road that runs past the graveyard, while all citizens agree in the conclusion that the specter must be caught, or the delusion, if it is a delusion, dissolved, before the summer season opens, before the summer season opens, or else Canarsie is doomed to be the dullest shore resort on Long Island. For the sake of Canarsie's future, Captain Brown, the lifesaver, has commissioned himself to run the mystery to earth, or thin air, and believing that publicity may lead some other community to lay claim to the ghost as an escaped attraction, he told an Evening World reporter of the terror it has created. 
Unlike most ghosts, Canarsie's apparition appears in the black apparel of a mourning widow. It was discovered, so Captain Brown said, by Will Ryder, a Salvation Army hero, who was returning home from a meeting the other night whistling gates ajar, when just at the entrance to the village graveyard, the specter appeared and raised a hand of warning. Ryder is a temperance man, a thorough soldier among the Salvationists, and believing that the time had come for him to solve his theory that ghosts are material, he reached out his hand to grasp the specter. As he did so, it disappeared, vanishing into the graveyard atmosphere just as Ryder's hat rose several inches and every hair of his head pointed directly toward the Milky Way. Thoroughly frightened, Ryder ran along the church road and frantically begged Captain Miller, whom he met, to take him home. The experience of Richard Guiler, as related by Captain Brown, was even more exciting than that of Ryder. Guiler is not gifted with the peculiar ability of discernment that enables a man to recognize a ghost when he sees one, and when he met the apparition and was asked by it in anything but a graveyard tone to point the way to a neighborhood farmhouse, Guiler gallantly offered to act as escort. When it was necessary to leap over a brook, he jumped first and then turned to give the ghost his hand. It had disappeared, however and only the fact that there was water near saved the young man from fainting. Even policeman Frank Ford claims he met the figure near a lumber yard, but when he went to arrest it as a suspicious character, it vanished. He related his experience to Judge Ford, but the latter is an extremely practical man and told an Evening World reporter that it is his opinion the specter is a suspicious husband impersonating a ghost for the purpose of getting evidence that may be used in a possible divorce suit. Canarsie is thoroughly excited, however, and detectives are now more popular than the owners of oyster beds. I think we got a reporter who's not taking this ghost story terribly seriously, but I run into that a lot. You've been listening to Spectral Edition. I'm Tim Prossel. I have close to 300 of these articles, all of them published in U.S. newspapers between the years 1865 and 1918. And I post one each Wednesday on my website. The name of that website is The Merry Ghost Hunter. I hope that you Google it and pay me a visit. Thanks for joining us for the Big Seance Podcast. We'd better get back to the table while there's still some candlelight left. I want to thank Daniel, who sent me an email last week. He says he loves the show and listens all the time. He also opened up with some concerns about inviting unknown spirits into our realm. I got a really nice email from our buddy Janice Carlson, who was a previous guest of mine from episode 10 a few years back. It was nice to hear from you, Janice. I received a five-star iTunes review from Patty Wanker, who says, entertaining and fun and free to boot. Yes, the podcasts are so very free. Uh, Patty Wanker says, Mr. Keller is delightful. He treats each guest with respect and has a witty sense of humor. Some of this can be over the top, but fun to listen when I cannot sleep. Patrick, I bet not too long from now you could even have a radio show. A fellow paranerd. Well, that would be interesting, Patty. So thank you for the compliment and the review. Thank you again to my guest, Lloyd Auerbach. And again, thank you for listening today our next episode will be greg newkirk and dana matthews they're the directors of the traveling museum of the paranormal and the occult i met them this last summer at the haunted america conference i had a brief interview with greg when i covered that conference oh but you just wait for this next episode peace out peri nerds for show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. 
You can also find and subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time.